Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. This is a sponsored episode by Regila Beauty. As women, our skincare needs are constantly evolving and changing. So it can get a little confusing when we need a new item to fit into our existing skincare routine to tackle new issues. Regila Beauty has a wide variety of items that are built to fit into your routine, whether you have youthful skin, mature skin, you're expecting, or you're even a new mama. If I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but just by adding something wonderful and affordable to it. Skin that looks and feels more even-toned, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, smaller pores. Well, Regila Beauty has the hydrating serum, and it is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It is perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or preparing for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals featuring hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C, the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner, moisturizer, without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it today by visiting Regila's Amazon shop at amazon.com slash Regila, R-E-J-A-L-L-A, or click the link in the description box now. Hi, family. Welcome back to Make Life Fun. Today, we're doing a very special episode where we end the year with a look back at some of our most memorable episodes from 2022. Let's jump in. Today on the show, we have Masako Kazawa with us, and I am just stoked to have her here. So welcome. Thank you so much, Josie, for having me. Yeah, I never really considered myself brave. But I, like some people have told me that, and I realized maybe I am not sure. I mean, I was scared of the unknown each step, but I couldn't picture myself living the life that was kind of in front of me, like unknown. Everything is kind of expected. And you can see yourself like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, living in that, probably in this kind of setting, doing this kind of work. It was very predetermined and I felt very uncomfortable seeing myself in that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it took so much courage. Even if you don't feel brave, that little you inside of you that was doing the drawings and like that little person was like that fire, right? The fire inside that was like kind of pushing you forward. Yeah. So after graduate school, like what did you start doing and where are you now from that (laughs) journey? Yeah. There's so much to like in in between. Yeah. um, So I got married between undergraduate school and then graduate school. We got married a week after the college graduation. Wow. And like, I was like 23 at that time. I never had a desire to get married at that age, but either way it happened. And, but the marriage was very challenging. We stayed together for 12 years, but like we were both really young. We didn't have enough self-awareness or awareness of anything at that age. And I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted in my life. And I felt like looking back, I could see the way I decided to get married and accept that proposal was because I was afraid. I was afraid if I didn't say yes to this proposal. Would I ever meet anybody who would love me as much? And the decision was made out of fear rather than out of love or desire. At that age, I had I didn't have the tools to go through those emotions and understand why I was feeling that way. I felt like everybody, you know, like everybody would feel uncomfortable and then unsure when they're making this type of life, big life changes and decisions. Yeah. So you were so young when you got married. 23 is so young. Like you said, we're just starting to discover what it is that even makes us tick. 
like what yeah. it is that even makes us like who like you were saying who who am I at 23 yeah like so that's what was a big decision that you made it was it was and then looking back that was the hardest thing hardest most challenging experience that mm-hmm. I had there was a lot of addiction in my ex-husband's life also it kind of developed into abusive situation and I just did not like I kind of lost myself in in that relationship and I have felt like I was kind of trapped and I didn't have like guts to like leave for so many years. And yeah, basically I did not know who I was and, and what I was capable of and what I could do. The example of marriage, like my parents are married, still married, you know, and then they're happy together. I had that example, but that does not mean that could like have applied to my situation because it was in a different generation. <laughs> different culture. Everything is different. I just could not use that as like a navigation to handle my marriage. We came to like point of like, oh, well, we should just, you know, call it quit. We should just get separated. Like we we went to that point like so many times throughout that 12 year period, but I just did not know why I was in that situation. And I felt like if I did not know why I was in that situation, I'll probably repeat the same thing with somebody else. And I didn't want to do that. And I felt like I couldn't leave until I figured that part out. What was that journey? Like, wow. Oh my gosh. Like, what was that journey of getting that, again, bravery? <laughs> like, oh my, bravery <laughs> keeps coming up for me for you. Like, you are just such a brave soul. Thank that you. Is- I guess I was trying to, like, figure out why the marriage was not working, why the relationship was not working. I just kept searching for the answer. <laughs> I couldn't find the answer. And so I had to keep searching. And that's how I stayed in a relationship for such a long time. But it came to a point that I finally woke up. I felt like I was asleep until then. But I finally woke up. Today, we are speaking to Melissa Clampett. She is the host of the Reawakened Mom podcast. And she is here today to talk to us about self-care and self-love within being a mom and how to be the best you. I mean, let's be real. You have kids and you love your kids and you love them so much. And, you know, when I first had my first son 15 years ago, I was like, I am going to be with my children all the time. I will love my children. I will take them to get my hair cut. I will do all the things with my child. But mama needs a break sometimes. Let's be real. And so, you know, it's just rediscovering how you can find those little snippets of time in your day for you and what makes you happy so that you can be the best mom. You can be the best wife, the best person, the best co-creator, the best entrepreneur that you can be. And if you're always giving, 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 then you have nothing left for yourself. Like I said, right place. Like in this community, it is all about pouring from that overflow, like filling yourself up so much that you can't help but give that extra from a place of like, there's so much. Yeah. So how did you get to this place where you want to help women find themselves? For me, I think it was being lost myself. I used to be a school teacher. My husband and I currently own a restaurant. You know, I have my boys. They're in so many activities. And so for many years, I mean, even as much as like not, well, not with the pandemic, but we were always on the go. So I was always taking them to a sporting event, always taking them to this, making sure that all of their needs are met, which is great. That's what we do as moms, right? But I put myself last. And so I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't doing the things that I used to love to do with the working out. I used to do roller derby, like all these things that I loved, I wasn't doing. And so I felt lost and I was getting resentful. I was getting angry, blaming other people, a little bit snippier around my house. And I just didn't feel like the person that I know that I am. Uh, it was almost like an out of body experience. So I'm like, this isn't me. Like, I don't want to be a yeller. Like, I don't want to lose my temper, but I don't know what else to do because I have no tools in my toolbox right now because I've given and I've given and I've given and I'm, I'm stuck. So for me, it was just finding little ways that I could get unstuck and, you know, what those things would be. And it was just taking a little bit of time for me. It started as going to the gym 
you know, early in the morning. And so I would go, go to the gym. And so it was just finding those things for me that were getting me back to Melissa. We're getting me back to the things that brought me energy and brought me joy so that I could be the best mom that I know that I can be because we're, we're our role models for our kids. So, you know, I want them to see like, you can take care of yourself and still be able to take care of other people. I love that so much. Yeah. Cause you can try and change everybody else. And, you know, I do have a little bit of control issues. I do like to try to control things. And so I'm working on getting better, but I was like, but if I'm not okay with me and I'm trying to change other people, that's a reflection of something I see in myself. So if I'm looking and I'm trying to say thanks to my kids or my husband or my friends about things, oh, well, maybe you should try this or this, then that's probably something that I need to work on. I need to go work on that. And so that's really how it all just kind of starts. And every day it's a practice and a journey. And my word of the year this year is joy. And so it's really coming back to myself and what brings me joy. Yep. Brings you joy. I love that. What brings you joy and coming back to that. And that word for the year of joy is like, I love it. We have it within ourselves to find that joy. We have it within ourselves to decide that that's what we're going to look for. And when we look for that, we're going to only see more of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I have so many years, I always do a word of the year. So I love to do a vision board. This year, my vision board was a lot of the things that how I want to feel. So how I want to feel throughout my day, throughout my household, throughout my family, throughout my relationships. And just the word joy just kept coming up for me because I know if I find joy in my relationships, if I find joy in, you know, my household, in, you know, my relationships with my husband and my kids and my friends and my businesses, you know, and finding joy and doing a podcast and social, like all the things, then I know that abundance is going to come to me because I'm, I'm having fun and it feels good. So if it doesn't feel good to me, then I say no, because I have such crazy energy awareness that if I do something that I don't want to be doing, like it can take me out, I swear, for like a week. Like, I'm like, I just need to go sleep because I'm a place I don't want to be. I made an obligation. I said yes. And I don't, I shouldn't have said yes. So I didn't set a good enough boundary. So I've gotten really good at, well, I should say I've gotten a lot better because it's never perfect, but it's always working about setting those boundaries because if not, then I can turn into a she-hawk sometimes. I am Angelica Prather. I am an income strategist for hairstylists and a business coach. And I help people that are hairstylists through my signature program, Charger Worth Academy. And what we do in Charger Worth Academy is we get you to grow your income without working more, right? So I have this less is more model that I created for myself that became the blueprint to help other beauty professionals kind of create that same lifestyle, right? I am also a mother of two beautiful children, five and four, they are 14 months apart. So your mama was busy, okay? But um, before I was any of those things, I was behind the chair for 20 years. I was a salon owner for 10 years and an educator for 10 years as well. And so I have a well diverse in the beauty industry. I love it, it's one of my favorite industries. And I also have a hair care product line, Robin Laurel and Company, that's named after my mom, who is deceased and actually started her journey in the hair care industry, but didn't get a chance to fulfill it at the age of 31, she passed away. So I'm just picking up the torch and I'm all about legacy. And that's why I am now helping other hairstylists live out their legacy, like actually live it now and create that future for themselves. So that's just a little bit about me <laughs> oh my gosh you are doing all the things busy mama yes <laughs> and helping and inspiring so many in the process so i'm gonna just get into it as hairstylist being behind the chair i love that the first thing you said is less is more my motto was always work smarter, not harder. I am no longer behind the chair myself, but I was in a cosmetologist for 10 years, 11 years, 11 years actually. <laughs> and behind the chair for eight of those and teaching for two. So I can totally relate with all that you were saying and what goes with all that. And before we started recording, you were speaking of being the CEO. When you go into the model of coming from being at a salon to being a booth renter. Mm -hmm. And I would love to speak on that because I know that that's a big transition. Yeah. There is like a roadmap that a lot of people follow in our industry. And that becomes this 
busy, right? This busy, and I have something that I teach all the time about the busy framework. When you're transitioning, where maybe you came from school, right? And then your goal was to either work in a salon, get your training up, and then move into booth renting. A lot of times when I see people go into booth renting, they don't see themselves as a CEO, mm -hmm. right? They still just put the cap on as I'm a hairstylist. Mm -hmm. And their focus is building a clientele, but it's not focused on building a business. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that ends up happening is I always see people, you know, go to all the technical skill classes. I am not knocking technical skill classes. That that is how we keep up with our trade and our profession. But there is another part of it that you have to step into the CEO. Mm -hmm. Number one, you're the CEO of your life. So what do you want your life to look like mm -hmm. while you're behind the chair, right? So that's the yes. first part. Your second part is the CEO of the business, right? This is a business, right? I don't care. You love connecting with people, but you still have to make a profit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm big on teaching stylists how to make a profit, how to pay yourself first, but also how to have reserve income. And so some of the busy framework that I see a lot, a lot of people who are going behind the chair even though you said work smarter, right? That's your mm -hmm. philosophy. People just don't know what that looks like in our industry because we're watching other people, right? So the busy ends up being broke, underpaid service yearly because they're so focused on, let me build the clientele. That becomes a rat race. So that means you're chasing clients rather than saying, what's the foundation of my business? Mm -hmm. And what is it gonna stand on? If I'm a hairstylist today, what does it look like five years from now? Right. What does it look like 10 years from now? And what does it look like 20 years from now? Mm -hmm. And so that transition of being a booth renter, it's all exciting, right? Cause you're like, oh, I own my own seat. Yes. But here's a different thing. When you're a booth renter, you're actually in an establishment right? So you're in an establishment with a name that is in someone else's business. Mm -hmm. You have to marry the vision, mm -hmm. right? You can't just rent a booth because you can afford it. You have to make sure that it aligns with the clientele that you want to attract, aligns with the lifestyle that you as a CEO, and do I marry the vision of the actual owner of the salon, right? right. You can't rent something if you don't really understand the value of what you're coming into. And mm -hmm. I feel like People that are just renting don't see that correlation and just like, I can afford it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to rent. And then they find themselves a little overwhelmed and burnt out. And so that's what I love to do to help people to avoid the burnout. Yes. <laughs> so I am so happy that you're here today on the show. I'm so excited for you to meet Marissa Lonick. Welcome, Marissa. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So mom life. Wow. I mean... It's different every day, I feel like, right? Like as much as we are on a routine here, we have a good system. I mean, you have to, when you have a large family, I mm -hmm. think especially, but even if you have one or two kids, I mean, it's, it's surely helpful when you have good systems in place. Each day is a bit different. I kind of look at it as it's like, well, A, it's the most rewarding and challenging job mm -hmm. that I've ever had the lowest monetary paying in that sense, but <laughs> the highest, definitely the highest impact and reward, the most important job for sure. And the one that teaches me the most, mm -hmm. the one that really like makes me stop and think often <laughs> about the choices I'm making, about the examples I'm setting about God, even just the way I'm living my own life, mm -hmm. not in, even in the parenting model, just in the, the human being model. So very impactful, I would say. <laughs> yes, very impactful. And I love that you brought up that it makes you look within yourself to make sure that you're setting that wonderful example yeah. for your children. And that is the biggest topic on the Make Life Fun show is that moms are doing that inner work and doing that for themselves so that they can be able to set those systems in place and have it flow with a little bit more ease. So if you don't mind speaking to a little bit of what your journey of like working on yourself so that you can of course, take it day yeah. by day and the changingness and the craziness that is motherhood. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think I was a victim of this. I think a lot of moms are victim of this is that when you enter motherhood, it's like your life just takes a total 180. Mm -hmm right? You go from having very little responsibility. You know, we all have responsibility. We've all got bills and jobs and, you know, maybe a spouse, maybe not, you know, there's lots of things of course that we're juggling before motherhood, but it, it amplifies quite a bit as you know, right. Yes. When you jump into being a mom, like all of a sudden there is a human being, a helpless, tiny mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. that you are in charge of 24 seven. 
And, you know, I think a lot of moms jump into that. A, they want to do the best possible job. They want to be the best possible mom. They want to get it right. In order for them to feel like they have to make that happen, they sacrifice everything about themselves. Mm -hmm. They put all of their energy, all of their love, all of their hours in the day, just anything you can think of toward their children. And even if you're, you know, in any situation, working mom, stay at home mom, we all feel that. We all Mm -hmm. feel that mom guilt. We all feel that sense of like wanting to do everything for the kids, right? Or we felt that at least when we entered motherhood, we've gone through that phase. And I think what, what I experienced and what I know a lot of my clients experience is that, Hey, that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That doesn't feel good because we're just depleted all the time. And B, we actually don't end up, it's so counterproductive because we don't end up showing up as the best mom, Mm -hmm. as the best version of ourselves when that's how we're treating the situation. So we think we're pouring everything into our kids or into our families And in the end, when we actually look back on it, we're like, oh, I was a horrible mom the (laughs) other day because I was just exhausted or Mm -hmm. I lost my patience so much because I'm not taking care of myself or I'm not doing anything nice for myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I really recognized that and I saw that a lot of these things that I thought is the way motherhood should be, Mm -hmm. were holding me back from taking care of myself from living my best life from like, I'm quite an ambitious woman. And I am sure many of your listeners are Mm -hmm. too. And and so are you, Josie, I bet when you're not feeding that ambition, you are coming from a place of depletion. And Mm -hmm. when you're coming from a place of depletion, you can't possibly give even close to your best self Mm -hmm. to the most important job you have, which is motherhood. I agree 100% with what you're saying and how you were saying that when you recognize that for yourself, did you develop a sort of practice for yourself or did you like, what did you do once you recognize that? Cause we can't, we can't pour from an empty cup. Cause I like to say, we have to fill ourselves up so that we are able to give the best of ourselves. Cause that's our, as a mother, like you're saying, it's our, our wish and our hope is to be the lighting example for our children. And so what, did you do for yourself to get that yeah. straight? Well, I'll tell you what wasn't working first. What yes. wasn't working was like, I would go through the cycle. I would go through the cycle of like doing all the things, working hard, taking care of the house, taking care of the kids, like doing everything for everyone, getting to that point where I was like having like a mini mental breakdown and feeling <laughs> super resentful of everything, doing something superficially nice for myself, like going to get my nails done or like doing, you know, like a date with a friend or watching bad reality TV or like whatever it is, right. Filling that, like putting a band aid on that situation and then repeating it all over again. And that doesn't work. Welcome mamas to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so excited to have you back with us. Today on the podcast, I have the Misty Love with us. So right now I am passionate about people living their most authentic life, including myself, and what that looks like, what that feels like, and how can we always take a step every day to get closer to being our most authentic self Mm -hmm. in every setting. Oh, that is so powerful because it's so true. We hear that be your authentic self. Sometimes it's not that cut and dry. And so I love that you're passionate about this and can speak on this a little bit more for us and also your journey to finding this passion for yourself. For sure. Yeah. So my journey started a long, long time ago. I was always a very conscious little girl, like and growing into a woman. I'm an old soul. I'm a deep feeler. I'm a highly sensitive person. I'm considered an empath in that I feel other people's energy. I feel mm-hmm. the vibe around me deeply in my body. And I've always been this way. I've always been a little different than everyone that was always around me. I never, ever really fit in. And so it, it was very uncomfortable throughout my childhood to never fit in even with my siblings and like my parents, you know? Mm -hmm. I just always felt so different. Then as I've gotten older, I've learned to embrace that and just Mm -hmm. be my authentic self because who the hell else am I gonna be, Mm -hmm. you know? But yeah, so my story started, I was, I'm an old soul. I was very outspoken, very bossy, very clear on the fact that 
that self-preservation piece was important for me, mm-hmm. even through all the bullying and the, the dissension and family and friendships and all that stuff. I always had a very clear vision that I was important for some mm-hmm. reason and I'm important to myself. And even though I didn't always act that out in certain behaviors, it was always my core was like, I need to figure out what's going on with Mm -hmm. me. So I was always mentioned, I was always told that something was wrong with me. I'm off. I feel too much. You're too intense. You're too this. And it's just like, Okay, maybe some of that intensity, maybe some of those things are from trauma, but most of those things are who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm not a bad person, you know? I've made mistakes. I haven't been a perfect person, but I am a deep feeler and I deeply care about people. I've always been that way. As I've gotten older, life has happened to me, relationships more specifically, and just the travels of life and how how one natural disaster can throw your life off, you know, depending upon where you're placed. And so I've had to recover first from my childhood. And then I had to recover from the adulting way that I was taught that wasn't the healthiest, you know, Mm -hmm. the habits, the giving too much, the always being available, the always allowing people free reign in your life just because they're related to you some type of way, you know, dating the wrong guys and accepting that because what else was I shown? I really wasn't shown much else, you know, right or wrong. I just didn't see anything. No one really talked to me. So there are so many things that I've had to figure out on my own. And this journey is monotonous and tedious and sometimes painful. But as deeply as I feel those things, I also feel the joy and the peace Mm -hmm. of really figuring out, you know, who I really am on a deep level and accepting that. That's the key. We can learn all these little idiosyncrasies about ourselves, but we've got to get to a place of accepting that. And I can really say at my ripe old age, (laughs) millennial, (laughs) I fully accept myself. And that's like the biggest start, the biggest core part of Mm self-love, you know, is just really accepting who you are because we're given messages all day, especially as women and especially as black women. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as mothers as well, there are so many expectations that people have of us, Mm -hmm. but they don't have them expectations of themselves. Like I'm going to need you to focus on yourself, you know? So yeah, my journey has been interesting coming from a big family, being the youngest in that family, Mm. but being an old soul, crazy juxtaposition. But, you know, we live and we learn. (laughs) We do, and we ride the roller coaster. That's what it is, isn't it? I love that you're speaking to that authentic self piece and embracing and accepting yourself for who you are. That is the umbrella of the show. And I would love for you to give some concrete tips and tools that you have used to kind of get yourself in that space where you're like, I have the quirks. I am not perfect. I'm going to accept them. I'm going to accept them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to treat myself as the queen that I am. What has gotten you to that place? (laughs) So what's gotten me to that place, honestly, has been a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And so I have learned a long time ago because I've dealt with chronic anxiety and depression and just mood issues and just feeling everybody's feelings all the time, not really knowing what's happening, thinking it's depression when it's really a wave, all of these things. So at first I had to teach myself how to think about my life. Mm. Welcome back, Soul Family. I am so excited. You're coming back to make life fun. I'm so happy to have you here. Today I have a treat for you. We have Megan Morin on the podcast today. And Megan, welcome to Make Life Fun. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan, and I'm the owner of the Mompreneur Guide. And I am all about helping mompreneurs create movements, go out there, build their authority, spread their mission and their message, but doing it on their terms and in the simplest way possible. Because as mompreneurs, if you are one who's listening, you know, we have to just streamline things just for our own sanity. And so 
That is a lot of my focus in my business. I'm actually a third generation mompreneur, which is why it, I am so passionate about this space because I've just grown up in it my whole life. And I just think it's such an amazing opportunity. So that's the entrepreneur side of my life. The mom side is that I have a three-year-old son, Jack. At the time of this recording, he turns three on Sunday. I have a one and a half year old daughter, Sophia. She turned one and a half yesterday. And then I have my amazing husband, Colin, who is actually a part of our team now. So it is just a whole family affair over here. We're absolutely loving it. We live outside of Cleveland, Ohio in a small town called Sugar and Falls. If I have Gilmore Girl fans listening, I'm like a super fan. We basically live in Stars Hollow. So we are just loving life over here. <laughs> oh yes. Loving life is what it's all about making life fun. So you are in the right place and I'm so excited for us to dive in. So I have a couple questions for you. So you're talking about being an authority and building that authority and streamlining. Will mm -hmm. you talk to us a little bit more about that and expand on that? For sure. Yeah. I think authority is something that we all need to start with a definition on because it's something that we hear thrown around, but sometimes it feels maybe a little aggressive <laughs> or, you know, we're, we're not sure, like, do I want to be that? Yeah. And so I think first and foremost, the base definition of an authority is somebody that, you know, like, and trust they're seen as an expert and a leader in your space. And the bigger thing though, and I like to talk about a natural authority and really think of them as this bigger picture of what they really do is they create a whole world around them. Mm -hmm. So when we think of like a Joanna Gaines, mm -hmm. like she's a vibe, she's a whole <laughs> thing. And you just, you see certain things and you think of her and the community around her is a bunch of like-minded people. And you've seen it spread from what started as a blog and then turned into a store and a TV show. And, you know, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now you see her everywhere. Like she's got something in Sherwin Williams and something in Target. And not to say that like to be an authority, you have to have an empire like that, but you can see how it is similar of creating whole world. And it reminds me of Shonda Rhimes as well. I was Brid watching Bridgerton binging it. And at the beginning of those episodes, every single time, the thing that pops up on the front is Shondaland. And how genius is that? Because she does, she creates a whole world around her because these women and other authorities that we know and love have leaned fully into who they are. They're okay to show up just as they are. They speak directly to you, which then is actually speaking to a bunch of yous. And that's how you get this amazing community around. And they're just really good at being a leader and, and being happy with where they are in life. And so that's really, when I talk about authority building, that's the first place that I like to start is like, what is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why are we so interested in that? Well, because of course we want to grow a community around us. We are mission driven mompreneurs. And so we want to go out there and serve and we feel we have a purpose. And so we want to share that. And the other part of that, that streamlining, simplifying part mm -hmm. is that's all fine and dandy, but Obviously, most of us probably don't have a team the size of Shonda Rhimes or Joanna Gaines. So how can we replicate that same concept, but in a super simple way so then we can be present and productive with our families? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is so important. And I love everything that you're saying about that authority piece, because it is you want to build that vision for yourself and be known, liked, and trust. And mm -hmm. so having that authority is sometimes hard for especially the new mompreneur, right? That is coming out there. That is just breaking out of her shell. That is, she doesn't quite know who she is yet. And so when she's hearing you talk about this, she's probably feeling a little overwhelmed right now. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so <laughs> what would you that? say yes to that mom who is like, okay, I want to be known, like can trust. And I want to set that authority for myself. But where do I begin? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is deep breath and yes. know that I feel like there comes a point in your journey more around like year three or five, or it doesn't have to have a specific timeline, but it's the point where you feel like, okay, I've gotten through the messy weeds of the beginning of my business. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a better sense of, okay, what in the world am I doing here? Who am I serving? I'm making some money. And so once you have that more stability, then you can breathe and be like, great. Now, how can I put kerosene on this fire? Mm -hmm. All right, friends, welcome back to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so excited to have you back with us. And I'm so excited for you guys to meet Beth Miller. She is going to be talking to us today about our inner child and our marriage and all the goodness. I am so excited for this conversation. And Beth, welcome. I'm Beth. I am a mom to three wonderfully crazy little men. They are six, eight, and 10. I've been married now 13 years. We just celebrated our anniversary on St. Patty's Day. And I am a marriage coach, a certified hypnotist, and I really help women 
who are really struggling within their marriages get to a place where they're happy again within their marriage and they no longer feel like angry, jealous, just triggered and resentful within their marriage. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's huge. And you have your hands full as well. (laughs) I do. Yes. Those (laughs) men keep me busy. They are wild, but they're so much fun. Yes. Right. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your journey as a mom and when it started out, what got you on this path of using the inner child and also using that as part of your mom journey and also as part of the marriage as well. Yeah, I didn't actually use it to start my mom journey, but it's actually helped me a ton Mm -hmm. with being a mom. What happened was I had a brain bleed, which is such a shocking thing. And sometimes it's even strange for me to say it out loud, but I had a brain bleed where I lost my ability to walk. And it slowly happened over about five days. It was a slow bleed. My husband kept saying, maybe you just need to go see the doctor. I was like, maybe I need to go to physio because it was primarily in my right leg. And what happened was I ended up in emerge. They're like, your brain is bleeding. It was an ER, like Grey's Anatomy kind of a moment where I was like, am I going to live? I have three little men at home and I couldn't do anything. I spent a month in hospital and you know what it did is it just kind of wiped out my identity. I didn't know who I was anymore. I wasn't a mom. I couldn't work. I couldn't walk. I was a runner. I couldn't work out. And I went into a really deep depression and had some crazy anxiety about my brain bleeding again and losing my ability to walk. I've since recovered. So things are really good now. I can walk and I can run again. I always say it turned my life upside down, but now my life is right side up. Mm. I'm a better mom. I'm a better wife. I'm a better person. I love myself more. So Mm. that's what really started this whole journey of starting the inner child work and the Mm. shadow work. And it was by accident. I was just trying to get rid of my anxiety and depression. I tried a ton of different things and stumbled across a few that really helped. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's beautiful. And I'm so happy that you've recovered and use that well roller coaster chaos into something so beautiful that you're helping people and changing lives with. That's just amazing. And I love that you're talking about shadow and loving yourself, but peace is huge. The conversation on make life fun is all about that big self-acceptance piece, which is so big, especially in motherhood and being a wife and in all things. So if you do not mind speaking a little bit on that self-love piece and what you found has worked for you personally, your clients and yeah. Yeah. So self-love, I didn't realize, but I didn't love myself in the beginning. I would say, yeah, yeah, I love myself. Of course, like ask yourself, just close your eyes and like, do I love myself? And you'll get an instant, like, you know what? I really do. I enjoy being with myself. I enjoy being alone. Things happen and I don't take it personally. I don't feel judged by others. Like that's when you really love yourself and you're in complete worth. You're confident and you know, you're deserving of everything you desire. But I wasn't in that place. I, I think I was a people pleaser. I got a lot of my validation from getting good grades, doing well in sports. And I liked other people's praise. When I got that, that filled me up. That made me feel like I was a good person. I relied so much on my external world that I didn't really love myself and work on my internal world. And so I think it's really important as a foundation to really learn to love yourself. And it's such a, like, do you love yourself? Like, how do you even know? And how do you even get there is a big question I often get. Yes, that one's a big one. So yeah, if you don't mind speaking on how do you know and how do you get there? Yeah, often when you feel like ungrounded, you don't, you feel stuck in your life. That's often a really good indicator that you're not living authentically and authentic, like being your authentic you. What does that really mean? It really means like your badass version of you, like unleashing that and just being who you want to be. And so often society and beliefs get us really stuck and stuck thinking like I should go to college. I should stay in the same job. I shouldn't be arguing with my partner. I should be a better mom. And when you should yourself, you're guilt tripping yourself. You're telling yourself that you're not good enough. And so the first step really in this whole process is really recognizing your triggers Mm -hmm. anytime. And I say triggers are when someone's words or someone else's actions, or even your own words and actions makes you feel a certain way Mm -hmm. that you don't want to feel, whether that's anger, resentment, jealousy, sad, guilty, shame, Mm -hmm. embarrassment. So when those emotions come up, you're not going to celebrate, but essentially that's what you want to do. You're like, I'm triggered. That means there's something within me that needs attention. It's my body's way of speaking up saying, you know what? 
things aren't in alignment right here. This isn't what I really want to do, or this is sucking my energy and making me exhausted. So when those things happen, that's when you really got to be like, okay, I got to go into this journey and figure out why am I really feeling this way instead of just stuffing it down. Because so often, especially as busy moms, we get mad at our kids for not putting on their socks. They come downstairs with a book instead, or we're late for work because they're still eating their breakfast or they're not listening. They're having a tantrum on the floor. And so often we don't deal with those emotions and we just stuff them down and we're like, we got to get to work. And we almost project our anger onto others. Sometimes we take it out on our kids being like, you're going to make mommy late instead of just getting into your kids shoes and realize what's really going on. Welcome back to the Make Life Fun show. I have a treat for you today. We have Mary Gooden on the show and she is here to talk to us all about loving ourselves deeply, all about how powerful we truly are if we can only allow ourselves to tap into that power. It's just so magical that we have this opportunity in the human experience to find one another and connect with one another on such a deep level, even through the screen, you know, to feel each other and to feel our humanness Mm. is a wonderful representation to me that we are in the very deepest levels of love Mm. because we're, we're so open and vulnerable that we can feel one another without having the physical presence, which has been such a huge part of my journey over the last several years. So I'm glad that we get to talk about it today. Yes, me too, Mary. So I would love for you to tell our listeners what is lighting you up about life right now. Tell us a little bit about yourself. The floor is yours. Oh, what lights me up so much. The biggest thing that truly lights me up is that that knowing that we are going to see version and a beautiful presentation of living a life of unconditional love in my lifetime. And I mm-hmm. hear that through through my guides every moment of every day that we are actually going to get to see this place of humanity, the heart of humanity, which I represent and stand for. So as uh, Josie said, my name is Mary Gooden. I am the CEO and founder of Divine Destiny Publishing. I am a fully embodied channel for the divine feminine Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. I am an open, willing, and committed human and bringing in these very beautiful heaven on earth codes. Mm -hmm. I believe that abundance thrives in our ability to stay authentic and aligned. And the more that we go and we allow ourselves to be seen inside, to do this inner clearing, this inner work, and we align with our self-acceptance, our self-trust, and our self-love, we see that change right in front of us every day. I am an avid storyteller, so I love sharing stories. I love hearing stories. I love creating platforms for others to share their stories and with the globe, all over the globe, because we know. We know our mission is global and we know that what transpired over the last several years of this evolution of humanity was to show us that very Mm -hmm. truth, that we are living in a global, expanding, collective consciousness and the new earth leadership is here Mm -hmm. and it is love. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it is love indeed. So earlier we were speaking about how you, you bring these books to life with multiple authors. I would love for you to tell that story again, how it magically sort of works its way in that wonder. Yeah, this is, this is what I love to call the VIP experience. Truly it is Uh, everything that I I get to offer as a vessel, as a service, as a soul is a done for you service. Mm -hmm. And I love that. One way it came across is when I, when I first aligned with uh, the practices and the teachings of yoga over 20 years ago is I get to teach to all levels. I get to serve all levels, which is a big power for me. And now that I'm, I'm feeling the full embodiment of this divine, divine channel, it makes sense. But multi-author books is one of one of my experiences that actually allowed me to open my heart and stand on a global stage and basically and say, this is who I am and this is what I came to share. And this is part of the journey of my life, you know, and it's the deep stuff that that showed me who I was and asked me to be a wave, to be a ripple, to be a voice of triumph and 
to be an inspiration mm -hmm. so that everyone can feel safe, supported, and loved. And that's how it started for me. I wrote my first story in a book called Phoenix. Eight months later, I became the Vessel of Divine Destiny Publishing, which we create now the multi-author books. Welcome to the Make Life Fun Show. Today we have Elena on the Make Life Fun Show, Elena Fernandez, and I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me and for everything that you're doing to help our listeners. Yes. Oh, that's, oh, you bring the joy. <laughs> so yes, please tell us about yourself. And you were telling me how you're a mom of four and I know how that is. <laughs> I don't know how that is in my own body, but I know how that is because I just know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think that we all know because whether you have one child or many children, it's really the same experience of motherhood, right? We are nurturing a human being and ushering them through this crazy thing that we call life. So absolutely, I think that that's a beautiful thing. And why I do what I do is because as moms, we need a village, we need a community. And that's why I created the Positive Mom and the Positive Mom community. Because when we speak the mom language, sometimes other people cannot understand that. But we do know as moms what it takes to really be present with our children and the things that we go through on a daily basis and how hard it is and the struggle that we face every single day. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about being a positive mom, it's not about rainbows and butterflies. Yes, it is. It's magical. We have children in our home and they are magical. But the experience itself of being having this sense of responsibility, having the pressures of the world, having the inner voices telling us what we should and must and could be doing, it really is an intense process. So I, I received that because, you know, having four children really is an exponential <laughs> work. And, and I'm a single mom, so there's a, a wow. lot more added onto that. And, and I think that as we unite as moms, you know, like listening to your podcast and, mm -hmm. and being in this show, it means that we're seeking and that we can actually find a support and a light and people like us that really understand so that we know that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And this is what drives me, that we are not alone and that we've got this. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love all that you're saying because it's so true. We need that sense of community. We need to be united. And you're speaking of seeking because I think that is so powerful, even that word that seeking, because we'll find what we're seeking if we're willing yes. to look for it, right? Yes. <laughs> And so yeah. being, yeah, kudos to you, single mom of four, like, wow, <laughs> that, yes, wow. Thank and the work you. that you're doing in this world too, positive moms is so amazing because it's not always easy to be positive. So I would like to start with that conversation. So how do we get to a place where it becomes easier to be positive? Because it's not always easy when we're in the chaos, when we're in the struggle of the day-to-day -day life. You know, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> because one thing that I've come to accept, you know, I've been through a lot of adversity. Mm -hmm. I was born to adversity and I am still in adversity. Mm -hmm. And it has been a very, very bumpy journey. And one thing that I have learned is that, no, we are not going to be in a life where everything is happy, everything is positive, everything is pleasant, everything is going steady that ha that's called death how do i know i've been there i was in a coma for eight days and in that experience you know i was pronounced dead i was looking at my body down there laying you know in the hospital bed and everybody around me and it was the first time in my life where i didn't feel pain i didn't feel pain in my body but I also didn't feel pain in my soul. It was just a very calm, peaceful, beautiful, just, you know, everything that we seek for in this life. But I was dead and I was 
not breathing with my own lungs and my own, you know, I didn't have oxygen in my body. Welcome back to season three of Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheaton, and today I have a fabulous guest for you. Her name is Miranda Clark, and she's going to be talking to us about love and relationships. And I am so jazzed about this topic today. I woke up jazzed. So I know that you are in for a treat. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, Miranda. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you for being here. So yeah. I'd like to give you the floor to talk about what it is that you're passionate about and what led you kind of to this love, like talking about love, relationships, yeah. and working with couples. Yeah. Well, I was in graduate school and going into grad school, I had this thought that, okay, I'm going to work with kids and teens. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be my thing. That's where most of my experience is from. And so doing some of the, the work in the classes and turns out I needed to have a couple of electives. So mm -hmm. I saw this couples therapy course and I knew the professor was amazing. So I was like, ah, why not? <laughs> come to find out. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, this, it totally opened me up at there. A big spark went off. And if someone had come to me in graduate school and said, Miranda, you're going to be working with couples in private practice to be like, no, I'm not. No way, Jose. That sounds terrible. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. It was the only thing that after each you know, class, I was like, yes, this feels right. Mm. So, so I started private practice right after graduation, which was kind of frowned upon. That's a whole nother thing, but I did it part-time. And I realized that after each session, I felt the same way when I was working mm -hmm. with a couple, I felt energized. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I was working with a teenager or an individual, it may have felt good, but I felt a little bit drained, mm -hmm. you know? So then I just continued with that path and I realized that, you know, a lot of these couples are having kids mm -hmm. <laughs> and it seems really stressful. <laughs> I thought, gosh, I would really love to work specifically with couples after having children because marriage and relationships and all that is such an investment and it's such a, a possible place to heal mm -hmm. from attachment trauma from parents. Why would you want to hold this so sacred and make sure that it's so strong before having kids? So I down the road discovered, you know, the Gottmans up in Seattle and that they have like a, a training program for bringing baby home to become an educator. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Yes. So long story short, I did the training for that and have now really incorporated that into my practice. And I used to run workshops that was pre-COVID and now I'm tweaking them to do it virtually, but. <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So you are led to have this capacity to help couples and it is so yeah. needed. Before we started recording, I was telling you how, like in my vision of what we were going to talk about today, the relationship, like you get to get the relationship that you want and it gets to be easy. But that was my soul speaking. My mind was like, mm picturing all the times of how hard it was <laughs> before mm -hmm. you get to the easy. So yeah. I would love your thought on that process of why is it that it, like you said, starts off with the butterflies feeling so good, mm -hmm. but then it gets hard in that messy middle. <laughs> yeah. I think so much of it has to do with our attachment of how we're raised. Mm -hmm. I was definitely a people pleaser mm -hmm. and you know, getting to a place now where I'm considered to be a former people pleaser <laughs> or in recovery, yeah. I'm in recovery. Me too, me too. <laughs> and so is my husband. And we, we have very similar experiences growing up, but I think when we have these preconceived like thoughts, so much of it is like the stories that we tell ourselves in our head that get in the way of authenticity with our partner. So we are making assumptions, creating these stories, and we don't open up and share those stories or those narratives. I know Brene Brown is really big on talking about like the story that's happening in my head. And I noticed personal example for myself when I was a child and my mom would be upset, she would clean, angry clean. I knew in that moment as a child, like, oh shit, she's mad. I did something wrong. I kind of went into this place mm -hmm. and fast forward to my marriage, you know, soon after getting married, when I noticed my partner would start to clean, I would instantly go back to that place. And I had the story in my head that was like, he's mad at me. 
I did some, he's upset with me. I I had that with me for Mm -hmm. so long. And then eventually I just said, you know what? There's a story that's happening for me right now that you're upset with me. Is that true? He's like, what? No, that's not true at all. And so it took a while to kind of reprogram Mm -hmm. my physical response to that. So again, like those relationships have the capacity to heal Mm -hmm. some of those wounds, but if we don't open up to allow ourselves to heal, then yeah, relationships are really hard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That was a beautiful imagery that you journey that you took us on because like you physically, as you were speaking it, I could feel it in my body because our body remembers it. Right. And so it's Mm -hmm. not only the story that we tell ourselves, but our body physically puts us back to that exact moment like almost like frozen in time. So I would Mm -hmm. love for you to tell us any tangible tips that the listener can take away from being able to impact the story, being able to soothe the nervous system, because that is what, Mm -hmm. that is one of the things that gets really like that freeze fright, like you were saying. And so I'd love for you to unpack it a little bit and give us some tangibles. How can we start to unpack the story and how can we soothe our nervous system in the process as well? Yeah. So often when we know that there's something there is when we're in a conversation with our partner and maybe one of us says something and the other person reacts Mm -hmm. and, and we think like, Whoa, where did, where did that come from? If it seems all of a sudden there's a wound there (laughs) and many couples that I work with, when they get to a place where conflict becomes heightened and our heart is beating a mm-hmm. hundred beats or more yeah. per minute. I actually have the exometers that I would use in session when I was in person. Now I just have people look at their Apple watch or Fitbit or, and so often our heart is beating before we realize mm-hmm. that we're getting triggered. Listeners, welcome. Welcome to the Make Life Fun Show. As you know, I'm your host, Josie. And today I have a treat. My gorgeous friend, Kate Kripke is here today on the Make Life Fun Show. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. I'm already having fun. <laughs> already making my day fun to be with you at the Make Life Fun Show. It's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Well, Kate, let us hear a little bit about you. What is it that is lighting you up? What is it that you're passionate about? And what got you started in this field of basically mothering the moms and the mom and wellness and how it is related to what like lights you up? Yeah, such a good question. So I am a maternal mental health clinician or specialist, which means that I've really committed my professional work into or around the mental health and wellness of mothers. So I am a licensed clinical social worker and a perinatal mental health counselor by training. And I started here in Boulder, Colorado, a what we call a collaborative care mental health center, maternal and early family mental health center. Collaborative care just means that we're focusing, we're looking at that from that biological, psychological, social perspective of mental health. That's really the lens at which I look at mental health and brain health and wellness. And I spent a lot of my time treating or supporting symptoms of depression and anxiety in my work with moms, whether they were brand new moms or moms with older kids. And quite frankly, Josie, while I really value psychotherapy, I think it's very useful for a lot of reasons. I think one of the things that happens when we are treating depression and anxiety is we get sometimes can get kind of stuck in the things that aren't Mm -hmm. going well. And it's the opposite of fun, by Mm -hmm. the way, right? And so I think I'm really focused right now on helping mothers, whether they're new mothers or mothers with older kids, to think about like, what does it actually mean to take care of our brains and our bodies in the way that helps us feel good? Mm -hmm. Because when we feel good, when we have top mental health and wellness, and we can talk more about what that means, we show up differently with our kids, right? And I am very, it's funny, I often say to the women that I'm working with, you think you're my client, but you're not actually my client. Your kids are my client because through you, we're creating all of this opportunity for these children to thrive. Mm -hmm. So I also have two teenage daughters and I have I had postpartum anxiety after my first daughter was born. So I've moved through the stages of challenge and motherhood for sure. But the truth is that I feel better than I ever have at Mm -hmm. almost 50. And my daughters are doing great. And I think there's that direct connection between Mm -hmm. 
how I'm doing mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, and how they're doing. We can't separate the two. So that's what lights me up, Juicy. It is so good. (laughs) Yeah. Changing the dialogue, right? How do we talk more about that part? Yeah. Yes. And uh, everything that you're saying is so true. And I came to this realization really early on in motherhood for myself, divinely, somehow, some way. It was just like, you are that it's you, like you take care of you and everything else flows effortlessly. Like, that's right. and people kept asking, like, why do you keep saying motherhood is easy? I was like, because I feel like I found this magic and you're yeah. speaking of it right now. This is yeah. it. So that's please right. speak more to, like you were saying, the top of the mental health and wellness, like, what does that look like? And I would love for you to dive in just yeah, just let us have yeah. it because it's no, so important. Great. It's so true. I love what you just said. So I want to start with that. You said mothering is easy mm-hmm. and people are like, what? <laughs> and it's not that there aren't challenges that come with motherhood. Of course okay. there are. But the way that we approach those challenges and how much in flow we are of just finding our own problem solving ways or seeing it for, you know, you can look at two sides of a coin, right? You can look at the one side, which is, oh, this is so hard. And then you can look at the other side of, in what ways does this not have to be so hard, yes, right? Yes. Welcome, welcome to Make Life Fun Podcast. I am so happy that you're here. Today, I have my friend, Christy Neller on the podcast. Christy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I cannot wait for this amazing conversation today. It's going to be Yay! super fun. Yay. Yes, I'm so excited for our, our listeners to hear all the fun things that you've been doing and not just your life, but incorporating it with your family. Because that was really when I was doing the research for this show that really I wrote family and I highlighted it and circled it because it's so important right a part of making life fun is including the ones that we love and bringing them on board so that is one of the conversations that I definitely want to have today amongst many so first and foremost I would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what is it that's bringing you the most joy right now Yeah, absolutely. These are all good, fun, juicy topics. So (laughs) for I'm Christy and I am a former creative director and brand strategist. And I was running this crazy, let's say overwhelming life in New York. It was fun. It was fast. It was exciting. And I sort of lost myself in the mix of all of that and wasn't really doing any kind of self-care, taking care of myself, or I would say I was having fun, but not, not the deep level of fun, like not the life-giving fun. Right. And so, you know, flash forward a decade, <laughs> had, got married, had babies, moved across the country, sort of decided that I wanted something different. And so I went back and got my coaching certification. Now, instead of, well, not instead of, I still do some design work, but instead of really going in and helping a brand bring a product to life or, you know, a story or a vision, I'm helping people bring their big dreams to life. And a big part of that is getting back to joy, Mm -hmm. pleasure, fun, and creativity, which you would be surprised. Adults are like adverse to creativity and fun. They're like, no, that's the work I'm doing. And it's really fulfilling and exciting. That is so great that you brought that up because you said it wasn't a deep life-giving joy. So I'd love for you to break that down for us because there is a difference because I've been in your shoes where I was out in the world looking like it was all magic, but inside it just wasn't that feeling of what you were saying, that life-giving joy. So I would love for you to break that down for us. I'm a perfect product of the conditioning of society that says you go to school, you work hard, you graduate at the top of your class, you kick some butt, you go get a job, you keep working, you climb that ladder and you, you know, you reach your dreams that way. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. Drive is amazing. And I had many, many blessings come to me because of that hard work. That said, that hard work also led me to burnout. And I didn't even know that was a thing. At the time that I burned out, I was still in the mindset that if somebody came in and said, oh my God, I'm so stressed. My response would be something like, oh, you're weak. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that. I would never say that to someone, but in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my God, put on your big girl panties. Mm -hmm. 
and let's get on with the business, right? Like, okay. Or have your small pity party and then let's move on. Mm -hmm. That was detrimental to me because that's how I was treating myself. Mm -hmm. And in that, when I would have a feeling about something, when I would have, you know, some friction, I would just blaze through it Mm -hmm. because I needed to be strong. I needed to forge my seat at the table as a woman. I needed people to not think that I was sensitive or you know, emotional Mm -hmm. or, you know, those things, because I wanted the seat at the table. I was very goal oriented. I think in that I lost myself. I lost my connection to self. Mm -hmm. So I became like a yes person in a way that I said yes to everything, whether it fit what I wanted to do, needed to do. And so I was so maxed out, Mm -hmm. so overtaxed and just so tired. Mm -hmm. And there was no filling the cup. Even though the job that I was doing was in my wheelhouse, was Mm -hmm. creativity unleashed, I was never filling the cup. I was just running, running, running. I was behind the eight ball and I was a perfectionist. So I like to say now I'm a recovering perfectionist (laughs) because it served me to be a perfectionist. I got to where I got to in my career because I was attuned to the details, but I realized, and this is the distinction that being attuned to the details doesn't have to be a perfectionist. It doesn't have to take away from you. You can care about those details. You can love them and you can revel in them. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. Get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makewifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.